We've always uh, been guided by the philosophy that we have to see which way the world is going to understand where technology is headed and uh, to discern from that trend what raw materials we need to get there from here. And given that the world is on a path of uh, electrification, we look to be at the lowest cost and most sustainable producer of electric metals to underpin the energy transformation. Now we've, uh, we, uh, we work all over Africa at Ivano Mines and our group has been all over the Middle East and we're very excited about the opening of Saudi Arabia for mineral exploration and also we're excited about the idea of having strategic partnerships with the Saudis uh, that would really benefit us in a lot of countries where we haven't really had a sustainable competitive advantage. We hope to really take advantage of the fact that there's been such dramatic change, such positive change in Saudi government policy. We'd love to be a part of it. The Saudi Shield is uh, old, cold craton, very old rocks, and, and hence have very high mineral potential. The fact that there was so much crude oil discovered early may have deflected attention for a few generations. But if you look at the plethora of copper and gold showings and other raw materials in the country, we think the potential is limitless for diamonds, rare earth, lithium, copper, gold, and other minerals we haven't even thought about in, in, in that whole shield. It's big, it's unexplored, and it's very important. And it's blessed by cheap energy, the bottom of the world cost curve, new infrastructure, and proximity to markets. So just looked at as an exploration project, we, we see the whole shield as being very underexplored. Same applies to neighboring countries like Oman and Yemen. Uh, very interesting geology, the world's biggest ophelite complex in Oman, for example. Very interesting rocks in Yemen. Huge mineral potential in the immediate region. And then jump across the Red Sea, uh, you know, jump on the other side of the fault. Enormous untested mineral potential in North Africa. We've worked in 59 countries that we can count that are really quite serious in the last 20 years. And one of the first things you need to know is you don't want to keep going to places that have been heavily explored. So going to Terra Incognita is very exciting for a geologist because it gives you the potential for a super large discovery, given that you're the first one there to look. So I think we shouldn't confine this just to looking in the shield, but taking Saudi partnerships around the world is a very attractive prospect. The mining industry um, disturbs a very, 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 very small part of the Earth's crust, but it's critically important because everything you touch, we either mined it or we grew it agriculturally. And actually, the extraction of crude oil and natural gas is, of course, a form of mining. You know, everything that you're using as the product of mining is how you recover hydrocarbons. So Saudi Arabia must have a very good touch for Mother Earth and an understanding where the wealth is come from. So we think it's an enormously attractive place to explore. I first went to the kingdom about 25 or 30 years ago on the discovery of Alamar, a very rich gold and zinc mine in Saudi Arabia that has now subsequently been developed. You know, acorns never fall very far from an oak tree. So enough has been discovered there to indicate that the potential is very high. For government policy, you generate a lot of employment. You generate a lot of work for younger people, and you're generating uh, metals that are required because the kingdom is now committed to achieving zero global warming gas within the kingdom. So all of the technologies that we're looking forward to in the world, uh, whether it's the internet or broadband or the cloud or the electrification of transportation, all of these things are going to put an enormous amount of value on the discovery of the relevant electrically conductive metals. Well, oil and gas has uh, really transformed a lot. Uh, for example, Saudi Arabia just announced a 200 trillion foot, uh, cubic foot unconventional gas field. And by developing that gas, that will dramatically reduce global warming gas from the old baseline. So technology has um, evolved enormously in relation to mining, both our exploration technology 
which uses enormous amounts of electrical energy to look into the earth non-invasively. We can now look through a sand cover and look for electrically conductive minerals. The way we will recover these metals will use less and less water and less and less energy. There's a whole series of disruptive technologies that we've been developing with the assistance of the French government for the last 18 years. And so this is not the mining of your dad or your granddad or your great granddad. This is a whole new uh, technology intensive industry uh, using remote sensing uh, from outer space, uh, spec multispectral imagery, gravity surveys, induced polarization, electromagnetics, machine learning and software to sort of separate the haystack from the needle. So when you have a, an area as large as Saudi Arabia, you're looking for the tiny fraction of 1% of that area that is electrically conductive and could have important mineral deposits. I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of copper and gold, if nothing else, discovered on the Arabian Shield. Probably other minerals like um, lithium, rare earths, diamonds are very possible uh, in, in that old cold craton. So the geological endowment is enormous but unexplored, and that's very exciting to an explorationist. You know, what happened in the 1980s is completely and utterly irrelevant. Uh, these major mining companies uh, were not built for the discovery process. Uh, and um, it means absolutely nothing. It means absolutely nothing. As you well know, the history of Oyotogoy, for example, or many other discoveries, uh, mineral assets are frequently discovered by the fifth or sixth owner. And even information that shows you where it's not is very valuable. If people are drilling in a certain type of geological environment and they say, oh, phooey, there's nothing here, they're actually contributing something to you so that you can go look in a different geological environment. It's not like a ham sandwich you know, that's all uniform. There's all kinds of geologic environments that have to be discovered on that Nubian shield. I just came back from Riyadh. I couldn't be more excited about what's happening in the kingdom. I think the visionary leadership uh, of the crown prince and the young ministers that I met was completely beyond my wildest dreams. If you're looking for a regional headquarters, you've got very inexpensive energy, You've got a young, educated population. You've got a central location in that part of the world. Infrastructure is second to none. Railroads have been built by Ma'adin, for example, opening up vast desert areas that never had a railroad. And uh, you have all modern telecommunications infrastructure, 5G wireless. You've got ministries that are anxious to help the discovery process. I couldn't, I couldn't find a better environment as an explorationist to go looking at. And I couldn't actually, I'm sitting here because I couldn't possibly be more excited about the transformation that I see in Saudi society. I see uh, the young generation of Saudis playing a leading global role in everything, in everything. They're gonna have a huge role on world peace and on the development of a new society. It's, it's amazing because I was there 30 years ago and the transformation that I saw in Saudi Arabia was a lot like the changes I saw in China from 30 years ago. But I was surprised. I, I didn't realize how many young, bright, talented people are there anxious to better their country. And we'd love to be a part of it. I am absolutely looking forward to coming to Riyadh for the second time in the last few months. Uh, to speak at the conference and have the opportunity to speak to such senior Saudi ministers and important international financial institutions. Although this is the first conference, I'm sure it's going to grow into something very important and very quickly. I know I spoke at the first BMO conference 25 years ago, and you just told me I spoke at the first Minds and Money. So I'm extremely excited to be there. I'm very much looking forward to it. And I'm encouraging everyone I know to try to beg entry and come along because it's going to be absolutely fascinating.